Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. With us is the Tony Award-winning Broadway director, Bartlett Shear. Bart Shear is the resident director of Lincoln Center Theater. His versatility and incredible range has extended not only to serious drama, such as Clifford Odette's Awake and Sing, J.T. Rogers' Oslo, and even Shakespeare, but also to the musical stage with his revivals of South Pacific King and I and Fiddler on the Roof. His enormous talent has also reached the Metropolitan Opera, where he has staged six new productions, including Barber of Seville, Tales of Hoffman, and now Romeo and Juliet. Alex Witchell of the New York Times has called him one of the most original and exciting directors in the American theater. Bart Shear, we're delighted to have you with us. Great to be here. Now, Bart, I've always wondered what goes into making a consummate director? Uh, um, well, uh, it actually takes quite a lot of time. Uh, uh, directors are like a, a unifying force. They have to be great collaborators. They have to be able to be people who can pull everybody together. So they sort of like um, ring leaders, you know, because they have to know about the lights and the sets and all the different areas and sort of pull them into one kind of focus. And it's taken me, I've been doing it over 30 years, so it takes kind of a bit of time. And are there stages in the development of a director? Um, I think a good director emerges slowly. Like um, you probably have a lot of kind of burning talent early and you have great ideas, um, but they have to be matched against experience. And usually a lot of these processes are so intense that half of the trick is uh, maintaining your cool through extremely heated uh, transformations as the show goes on because you're editing in front of people and people are freaking out and they're going through a lot of things and you're managing a lot of personalities and that just takes a lot of time to be comfortable in because uh, it's exhausting and it can be thrilling but it takes some time to to uh, go through the battle enough that you can uh, be happy in it be happy in it yeah now many directors are actors were you ever an actor no I mean I have acted but no I was never that kind of I was never that kind of person I love acting and I feel like I understand it well but one of the great uh, things about when I direct is I don't pretend to do it for the actor. I can help them, ask the right questions, lead them to the right places, be a good eye for them, but I couldn't ever do it. That's a hard art form. So what led you to become a director? Um, I, started as a, I started largely as a writer. I was in college writing plays, and um, the effort of trying to keep coming up with an entire new thing each time was kind mm -hmm. of a lot, and I moved my way into what I would call from the creative to the interpretive side, and uh, found that when you would give me something like Shakespeare or, or Chekhov or, you know, it could be a musical, that I really enjoyed taking something that was already made and bringing it to life. Uh, and uh, how do you uh, approach a, uh, a play or a musical that uh, you're going to direct? Uh, do you do research first? Or, uh, um, how does it work? It's always a little bit different. Uh, usually... Um, th they're very different. I mean, first of all, to prepare for an opera is completely different than to prepare for a musical or a play. They take a lot of time. Usually you prepare, uh, you prepare in such a way that you try and get the right kind of design and the right kind of ideas in order to explore the piece. You won't always know where you're going to end up, but you create the right, more or less, sandbox for exploring it, for making sense of it. And so the preparation goes into all the research, all, all of its past, all of its history, um, what it might be leaning toward in terms of contemporary ideas. Um, if it's a revival of a show that's from, you know, that's 200 years old, you have to ask what the immediate significance of doing it at this day and time in history is. So I always tend to be both quite immersed in the classical side of the work and at the same time I'm pretty deeply committed to whatever it's political or 
emotional or human stakes are right now, at whatever point in history I'm doing it. Yeah, so much of the work you've done uh, seems to resonate with the issues yeah. in contemporary society, not just uh, serious plays, but also a musical. So you look at Awake and Sing, uh, Odette's yeah. about a poor Jewish family in the Bronx during the Depression. Yeah. That's income inequality. Yeah, it was totally We've heard a lot about that. Yeah. Uh, South Pacific, about race, yeah. race relations. Uh, uh, King and I is about uh, gender and education and empowerment of women. Yeah. Uh, Fiddler on the Roof, refugees. Yeah. And now your latest, which is playing now, Oslo, uh, which is about jihad and terrorism and also making and, peace with your enemies. Yeah. It's about peace. It's and, about the idea of peace and whether it's possible in circumstances that are impossible. So if I'm doing something like Oslo, as much as I'm thinking about the relationship between the Palestinians and the Israelis in 1993. I also am thinking about um, being a citizen of the United States right now and wondering if it's possible to get Republicans and Democrats to ever agree on anything. And so when an audience comes in and looks at the show and they see this sort of process um, that the leads in um, the lead characters in Oslo went through, they wonder what is it, what is possible to bring intractable forces together. So. Um, you're always looking for the sort of double or triple game in theater. So what's on the surface, what's right below, and what are its implications beneath? Because for me, the really great part of the theater is the gray space between the audience and the piece, where the audience fills in the information that you're alluding to or suggesting so that they can begin their own conversation with the piece as they're watching it. Now, uh, the play Oslo kind of evolved in a unique way, didn't it? Yeah. Because uh, the protagonists are uh, two Norwegians. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, uh, the woman, uh, Mona, a member of the Norwegian uh, Foreign Service, uh, and her husband, uh, who uh, was really, I guess he was an official in a, a non-government organization. Yeah, he ran, a, he ran the FAFO Institute. Ran yeah. an NGO, and uh, they were, happened to be friends of yours. This well, before actually, the play was ever written. Yeah, yeah, before the play was written, I met Mona Jewell in front of our daughter's school at, at Chapin School in New York City, where um, they were best friends in second grade and got to know them. And I knew about Oslo, so I would ask questions. And um, we brought um, uh, Terry in to talk to our cast on Blood and Gifts. We did a play about Afghanistan and the Stinger missile program in the 80s. And he knew a lot about the region because he's been negotiating peace agreements there, you know, for the last 25 years. And as he was talking to the cast, both JT and I were like, well, Oslo JT might, is JT is our, Rogers. Yeah, is our, our writer. So this really smacks of Hamlet in a way with yeah. the, the director uh, orchestrating the play before the play is even written. Well, or there's I, the play within the play. Occasionally in my life and the work, I've stumbled on something which I thought was a good piece. Um, uh, JT Rogers and I are trying to do a whole series of plays on the Middle East. And the idea was to do Afghanistan. Um, he wants to do one on Iran in the 50s and the rise of the Shah and then one on the Egypt Spring. And at the same time, we were discussing Oslo and we would have dinner with, with Terry and it came up and it was really JT who was like, well, this seems like the right seeds of a play, um, but it all kind of came together in that way. So Now, is the play a docudrama or is it the dramatization of uh, real life events or is it something else? Um, it's a dramatization of real life events. The nice part about Oslo and what happened between January and September of 1993 is that in all the accounts that we have of it, the accounts agree. The only thing they don't agree about is who gets credit for who <laughs> did it. Uh, they all disagree about that. But um, the accounts are there. The, the ingredients for making good theater are also there. There's a tight timeline. It's January to September. There are two outsiders. Um, Terry and Mona, the Norwegians who acts as proxy into this, the conversation. We're talking 1993. Yeah. They, they are the ones who lead this back-channel negotiation. So it, it allows for us to have a, a memory, uh, like a history play, like you'd have in Shakespeare, of a particular time, and then have a conversation we're not used to having about whether it's possible for the Israelis and the Palestinians to talk about peace in the Middle East or talk about the region. Very, very, very frank conversations happen in the play. The play's extremely funny um, because they were quite, it's all behind closed doors, and so the way they behaved with each other was quite intense and quite funny and quite crazy. And it's supposed to be secret, so you're yeah. peeling off the veneer. Yeah, so you get to go behind closed doors and see what's happening. The room where it happened. Yes, exactly. It's, it's very much a kind of um, 
uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda Hamilton version of a particular time in history. Yeah. And uh, so you explore the relationships between the Israelis and the Palestinians, uh, but there's also the relationship between the couple. Yeah. Um, and um, how did how'd you do that? These are friends of yours. Yeah, well, interesting part is that when we agreed we were going to write the play, we, we made a deal with um, people involved in it that they could never see it. In other words, we, we were going to write it, and they, they just were going to have to come and watch it, uh, including Perez. We met Shimon Perez, too, who was willing to help. And we went Interesting, to it Norway. coincides with the, the, yeah. the death of Perez, who yeah, was so we, involved in this whole... Yeah, and we were hoping he was going to come. He, yeah. he was such a great um, uh, man. But um, for Terry and Mona, we, we knew this. They're, they're very different personalities and brought very different things to the, to the negotiation in terms of how they supported it. So... J.T. Rogers, as the writer, made some, you know, he made some choices about how that relationship built, but it gives you a human way of exploring the piece and moving through the piece, and that's what, it's part of what makes the drama so exciting. Now, uh, this play, uh, Ben Brantley of the New York Times uh, said, uh, what director Bart Scheer has created is a streamlined time machine, comfortably appointed enough to forestall jet lag. Uh, were you trying to create a streamlined time machine? Um, the advantage of doing theater that's different than film is that um, you can, I've always wanted to do like a thriller in the theater, like intellect, this becomes like an intellectual thri thriller, is that in theater, because the audience is at a distance looking at an event in front of them, I can do more than one thing at the same time, and I can overlap time in a way, so you can start one scene while the other scene's still going on, so it's very tight in its composition. And so it, it, it forces the audience to be juggling several things at once. It's like having four pages open on your computer at the same time, and you can take in all of them. You can see all these things at once, and we integrate video projections with it at the same time. So audiences are quite um, engaged uh, by more than one event at the same time, and they're having to make very quick calculations about what choices have to be made to keep the thing going. So it makes for a really, th hopefully, thrilling evening, and it's pretty fun. Let's move on to South Pacific okay. musical, an yeah. iconic musical. Uh, you won a Tony for it mm -hmm. in uh, 2008. It's a revival. Uh, how did you uh, see uh, the show, South Pacific? Yeah, well, the, in, in the case of South Pacific, we had a really big task, which was it had not been revived on Broadway for almost 60 years. It was one of the most beloved pieces uh, in the Rodgers and Hammerstein um, canon. Uh, it was most beloved because it was deeply um, looked to by a generation of people who just gotten out of the war uh, because it opened in 49 or so. And um, it was hugely about their experience. And it was dealing also with issues of race, etc. So you went ahead 60 years, you had to recreate the spirit of that. And you had to also look at what was different. And when you went into the history and you saw the questions of race that were in there, the questions of segregation in the military and how things changed, it became a different story. It became a story about who's allowed into our family, who's allowed into um, the family. In that case, is can a fa family be of mixed race? Can she accept, as a person from Arkansas, you know, this sort of new person in her life, uh, in Emile de Beck and his kids? So that kind of thing became the center of the piece. At the same time, there's huge questions about gay marriage and who were able to be in families. And what you do in the theaters, I don't make, I don't come to conclusions for people. I go back to our history where we were asking the question one time before and ask it again. And so the audience brings their new experience of who they are and their memory into the piece and they ask the question over again the same way they do in Oslo. So that's where history plays are powerful. They allow us to remember and reconnect and ask and evaluate where we are now. And it gives us a chance to make sense of it. And it, it came at a very good time. Uh, we just were electing Obama as president, and it came at a time when we could really see that we actually got better. We actually improved. And maybe I am more attracted to stories where there's potential or hope or growth. Um, or a happy ending. Yeah, well, not a happy ending. It, ha it happens to have a happy ending. But um, even in the case of Oslo, I'm excited by the fact that it, they came to an agreement. It's not a perfect agreement. It didn't work out, but they could find middle ground. They could find a way to have a conversation, which is even more difficult now than it was then. So people 
uh, at least like the idea that we can, we can actually perhaps progress. How do you explore these uh, powerful themes and still preserve the musical values? I mean, people still come to hear a uh, Some Enchanted Evening and I'm as corny as Kansas in August. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you explore them easily if you have Rodgers and Hammerstein writing them because they happen to be extraordinary pieces of musical theater. The great thing about Rodgers and Hammerstein was they were so good at that, but also they were very experimental for their time. They were trying new themes, new ideas, new kinds of stories and trying to put them together. And so it's not, that's one of the easier parts, to be honest, because it does give relief to the seriousness of the story. It could be the same um, if you take uh, Verdi's Otello, which I did at the Met last year, where you have this extraordinary Shakespeare but in a musical form, you find much newer and richer things that Verdi and Boito just pulled out of there that are very powerful, very different than Shakespeare's. And the music is it's pretty helpful for an actor if there are 80 people in the pit supporting the emotional journey of what you're trying to express with all the scale that music can provide. Uh, are you a student of music? Uh, I'm, I'm good at... Uh, I'm good at the rhythm of music, and I hear music extremely well, and I study music very hard when I'm preparing. Um, when you work in a place like opera, you have the support of a great music director, so if it happens to be with Maestro Levine, um, I'm a student of Maestro Levine's in that case. <laughs> so we work together to make a piece. Uh, it's different for the director in that case. What I have to do about making the movement support the line of the music is different than what the musicians have to do. Um, the incredible thing about opera is how they do, how, how a singer does all of it at the same time. You also went on to do uh, another Rodgers and Hammerstein hit, uh, The King and I, yeah. and won a Tony for Kelly O'Hara as yeah. Anna, uh, the teacher who comes to teach uh, the children of the King of Siam. Uh, you were nominated for a Tony for The King and I. Um, and, uh, how did you see The King and I? Did you approach it the same way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, The King and I has a different thing that it brings up. It talks, it's, it's deeply about um, a subject that's incredibly important, the position of women in the third world, the position of uh, education for women in the third world. Uh, and so you, you look at it now and you go, this is a huge question in Afghanistan, throughout the Middle East, and throughout any uh, parts of impoverished areas where there's inequality at a great scale. Um, so you go deeply into 1862 and you try to tell that story exactly as it was because there was a king caught between a traditional and a modern culture, his country undergoing enormous change, besieged by imperialism, who actually learns and pushes his culture to change. And the promise of that, that there can be growth within these incredibly complex situations, is something when audiences come back to it, they make their own associations. They, oh, go, that's just like now, or that's different. And uh, so, you know, it's getting to know you, even though it seems like this very sweet song from, you know, 1952, is in fact still an important question, like how this, these cultures intersect, how the West and the East make sense of each other, and how we learn about the oppression of women anywhere becomes, and how you watch a king actually change, actually change his culture and make a new decision. That's a huge thing. At, at the Beaumont, uh, there was a thrust stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My overriding impression of your production is the king is out in front. It's all about the king. Yeah. Even though there's 51 people in the cast, it's very much a story about two people who are struggling and learning from each other very intensely. The great thing about the Vivian Beaumont Theater if you, and people who come to Lincoln Center is it's literally the best place to make a piece of theater in the United States because it, it has, it's so epically big and yet it, the thrust allows it to become so profoundly intimate. So audiences who are used to watching film or watching something on their computer have an enormous experience of deep intimacy and closeness to an actor against a backdrop that's vast and huge, and you can't get that relationship in many theaters. We're now doing it for the tour, and I have to adjust it from the thrust into a proscenium, and it's a chore. It's proscenium a is, is it's just the box. Picture, picture yeah. frame box. Yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're in the Beaumont, there's 1,100 seats, and there's 1,100 points of view. They're all seeing something different because they're wrapping around the thing. So it's quite a complex series of math 
Whereas if you're in a proscenium, essentially you're controlling one point of view. Now, what about the musical values in The King and I? Because uh, you, it's somewhat different from South Pacific. You have kind of a mixture of musical Yeah, values. you do. I mean, they, didn't, they chose not to use an Eastern kind of musical scale. They kept it in um, a Western uh, uh, idiom for how they made the, the music. But uh, the, probably the big difference is actually the ballet. There's this fantastic ballet that Jerome Robbins choreographed his, in you know his early work that you know that I think if you were to make a new musical now it'd be pretty big thing for you to convince people to put a ballet in the middle of it you know mm -hmm. it just doesn't work that way you kept the, the Robbins choreography yeah we kept the Robin choreography at least and, for the Uncle Tom sequence yeah no to adjust it out and yeah. it's uh, it's quite um, a profound experience when the audience is switching vernaculars from the musical from the musical into literally a ballet for 18 minutes of the show. Um, but they're thrilled. They have quite uh, a great deal of love for it. It had to adjust to a thrust, so they were even closer to the dance. Um, but it's, it's a, as a musical, it's enormously uh, approachable. They were very good at creating um, uh, an access uh, and a humanity to the music. Um, they were the best. Tell about working with uh, Kelly O'Hara and Ken Watanabe as Anna and the King. There's an extraordinary chemistry between the two when they did the Shall We Dance number. I mean, yeah. Did you as the director generate that between them? Um, no, luckily I hire really wonderful people, <laughs> so I don't. I mean, uh, getting Ken to do the piece was uh, quite a chore. I actually, he was, I think he was filming Godzilla or something in Vancouver. And one of the biggest questions, since Ewell Brenner was so indelible in the part, was to find somebody who could really make it new for now. So I flew to meet Ken and sort of, I, don't, I wouldn't say I begged him, but it might have been close <laughs> to begging him to do it. And um, the interesting thing is he's deeply Japanese in his approach to everything. And Kelly is really like a profound American girl from Oklahoma. So part of the energy of it was the collision between the two of them. Was that an enchanted evening when they met? Yeah, well, it was very, it was, it was it actually, it took time. It took time for them to get to know each other and bridge this enormous gap. So you then morph into Grand Opera. How did you get into Grand Opera? Um, I was working in uh, Seattle, um, uh, running a theater called the Intamon when I was asked by Spate Jenkins who ran the Seattle Opera to do an opera there uh, called Morning Becomes Electra and it came here and from there um, Peter Gelb asked me to do my first opera at the Met with Barbara Seville and then I got asked to do some in Europe and places like that. Um, it was an adjustment. I'm glad it didn't happen till later in my career. I was oh, actually in my 40s. I'd done musicals and things before that. The preparation for an opera is quite quite an intense task. Well, Gelb said he uh, wanted you there to jolt the art form. Do you think you jolted the art form? Um, I, th I brought some theatrical innovation to it. I'm sure there are many critics in the opera world and there are many very powerful innovators uh, in the opera world who might have brought new things to it. I think I brought um, uh, an el electrifying plastic mobility to it where I could do it. It depends a lot on the actual piece, something like Barbara Seville. I think I abstracted it and made, brought it very out to the audience in a physical way. Because um, you added this passerelle. Yeah, I had a passerelle that came around. Smacks the front. of the thrust stage. It does, at a the little bit the thrust. At, it also, at the Metropolitan Opera. It had yeah. never been done before. It hadn't been done before, and also it was one of those things which changed the architecture of the room. It made you have to have a slightly different relationship to the piece, and it's a very presentational uh, opera. Uh, it has very weird sequences at the end of the first act where they're all you know, six people singing at the same time. And if you can get them all out there downstage doing that, it can be quite fun. Well, there are uh, additional challenges in an opera that don't exist in a play or a musical. Isn't that true? Because the, uh, there's a limited pool of performers. They come from all over the world. They know the part. They, uh, by the time they get there, they have their own ideas about how the part should be played. Yeah. And, and what does the director do? Uh, a director learns to work fast. <laughs> and these are um, all very temperamental people. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're not. I don't think they're temperamental there, but they don't suffer fools. You know, I mean, I've literally had opter, opera singers on my first show at the Met, say in front of me to the other opera singer, oh, he's good, you can listen to him. Because they're so used to adapting to circumstances where they get no help and they have to work quite quickly that they need, they need support quickly and fast to make something work. And they're quite eager and quite 
quite amazing artists for what yeah. they do, but they need to be challenged and pushed, and you have very little time at the Met. So. Well, Bart Scher, uh, you are good because uh, Anthony Tomasini of the New York Times, as to Barbara Seville, said, uh, quote, the director Bartlett Scher making his Met debut has embraced the opera's atmosphere of intrigue and subterfuge. The opera is freshened by Mr. Scheer, bringing his perspective as an acclaimed theater director. So the critics of the opera uh, praised you, and it was good news for, uh, yes, for Bart okay. Scheer. That time so, it went okay. Uh, so I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, what's new? What's next? Uh, well, I will be doing uh, Romeo et Juliette, which is a Gounod opera at the Met. Um, it's one that I've done before in Salzburg and in Milan and in Chicago. So it's, it's a fun one. And bringing Oslo back is a very, very cherished and exciting thing for Lincoln Center. So two separate couples, but a lot of drama and a lot of intrigue. Yes, very, so very. Bart yes. Scheer, I'm sorry we've come to the end because it's been marvelous. Thank you so much for coming by. Great, thanks. Mr. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best. Take care. When you feel the call, you cross a crowded room and fly to the side and make your own. All although your life you may dream all Never let her go Once you have fallen